This video is sponsored by Skillshare. enjoyer of fiction. I love stories, but once in a while I just really enjoy a good non-fiction book just to learn something new, you know. So I thought it would be fun in this video to share every little thing that I've learned from the non-fiction books that I've read. I'm currently staying at my parents' house for the summer, so we first have to travel back to my uni room where I have all my books so I can show them to you. I've read more nonfiction books than the ones I'll be sharing in this video, but I just chose 12 books that I did get a very distinct message from, or that has like one thing that's just really stuck with me. And by sharing that, maybe you will also learn a new thing. The thing with nonfiction is that of course there is substantially more information in them than just one message, but I think it's interesting that everyone who reads a book probably has a different thing that stuck with them the most. And in this video I'm simply sharing mine. Okay. Also, I just want to say that just because I'm sharing these books in my video doesn't mean that they are the best nonfiction books I've ever read. There are some great ones that I read that I couldn't really boil down to just one message or one thing that has stuck with me, um, so that it's not in this video. Okay, so let's begin with my favorite nonfiction book. This book explains the thoughts of Taoism through Winnie the Pooh. And I mostly really love its message about the importance of simplicity. Oftentimes, especially in Western countries, complexity is seen as better and deeper and more intellectual, but often it's just unnecessary. And in the thoughts of Taoism, actually the more simple things are seen as better. This is Viktor Frankl's life philosophy that he came up with when he was held in a concentration camp during World War II. I think the main message of this book is that man needs a meaning in order to withstand suffering. And under any type of suffering, you still have the freedom and responsibility to change your attitude and find a meaning. Because according to him, suffering ceases to be suffering once you find something to live for. And you don't necessarily have to find meaning in yourself. You can definitely find meaning in experiences and also in other people. So this book is kind of a summary of a bunch of continental philosophers combined with a bit of biographical information on them. And of course I've learned many different things <laughs> in this book, like all the different philosophies from these philosophers. But the main thing that I learned from this is that if you want to understand philosophy, it is so useful to also kind of understand a little bit about the philosopher's life because it usually hugely makes sense with the philosophy that they developed. I remember reading this book when I was also taking a class on continental philosophy and just reading about these philosophers' lives may be able to retain all the information even better. Before we move on, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. If you're watching this video, that probably means that you enjoy learning new things, in which case you know, like you know that Skillshare is like perfect for you. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They offer thousands of inspiring classes from topics including illustration, design, photography, freelancing, and more. I've been really enjoying Ali Abdal's masterclasses on productivity. I even make notes on them <laughs> and I revisit those notes quite often about like getting into the workflow, that stuff being more effective. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership so you can start exploring your creativity today. It's a perfect way to end the summer. Now back to the books. This is an essay collection on a variety of feminist topics. And one thing this book really opened my eyes to is the importance of language in activism. Usually when people aren't aware of the problem, it's because it doesn't have a name yet. There's no word to describe it. 
So naming a problem can be the first step in setting it apart as a real problem. Here are some examples of terms that feminists have introduced that were important for introducing the people to a concept that they were not aware of. Giving something a name helps us conceptualize problems in our minds, which is an important step in fighting it. This is a quick book about hope when everything seems to go wrong. The main thing that I got from this is that we shouldn't be held back by striving for a perfect world and then feeling let down when the world doesn't end up perfect. We cannot create a perfect world, we can only create a better one. And I really appreciated this quote that was shared in the book. Utopia is on the horizon. When I walk two steps, it takes two steps back. I walk ten steps and it is ten steps further away. What is utopia for? It is for this, for walking. This is a self-help book about the author's concept of essentialism, which is focusing only on what's essential to increase productivity. I think it's really important and valuable to learn to get the essential stuff done instead of wasting time on trying to get everything done and right. If you're spending all your time on getting every single thing perfect, you're most likely just spending unnecessary time on things that most people won't notice and will barely add anything to the end result. So just spend your energy wisely. A self-help slash psychology slash philosophy book. I really like the part where they talked about how it is not always good to like self-affirm, so saying I am 100%, I am amazing, I am fantastic, but instead to go for self-acceptance accept that you are maybe at 60% and not 100% and that's okay. And then have the courage to change where you can. And in addition to that, accept yourself not on your acts, but on your being. Because then you can always accept yourself. You being and existing in this world already makes you valuable and worthy of acceptance. This is an essay collection on feminism, racism, film, and all sorts of media. I actually mostly really like this quote at the beginning, like the introduction to the book. We hold feminism to an unreasonable standard, where the movement must be everything we want and must always make the best choices. When feminism falls short of our expectations, we decide the problem is with feminism, rather than the flawed people who act in the name of the movement. The problem with a movement is that often they are associated with the most visible figures. It just really reminds me of like people who completely denounce the idea of feminism because they've seen like a few feminists that they don't like and then they just completely disregard the, the entire idea of feminism. So I actually didn't really get that much out of this book, but there was like one study that has always stuck with me. And it shows that when men speak more during meetings at work, they are seen as more intelligent. But when women speak up more in meetings, they are seen as less intelligent than those who do not speak up. That's something to think about. So did you know that trees communicate? <laughs> for example, when at one part of a forest the trees are being eaten by, for example, giraffes, they can send signals that lets the trees further down the line know that there's danger coming, and then those trees can create kind of a substance in their leaves that make it distasteful to animals, so they will stop eating them. That's really cool. <laughs> I just think that's a really cool fact. By the Nobel Prize winner in economic psychology, a book about how our thinking works and mostly about how it betrays us. Basically, this book is just about how stupid we think. <laughs> so one thing that I wrote down about this book is something about cognitive ease. So our brains are really bad at distinguishing between true things and things that we've just heard very frequently. If something rings a bell because you've heard it before, we are quicker to assume that it then must be true. 
We are quicker to believe statements that are cognitively easy to read or to understand. So it might have nothing to do with whether it makes sense. Just because it's easy and quick for us to understand, we'll just assume that it's true. So we are also more likely to believe something is true just because we've heard it more often. This book is a plea for a more positive view of humanity. So you know the famous Stanford prison experiment in which participants got divided into prisoners and guards and the guards turned cruel and power hungry. It's the experiment that's taught in school very often as an example of how people easily turn onto each other and do bad things when they are given permission. Well, turns out it was a really bad experiment and the results should not be taken seriously. It was originally conducted to test the effects of mean guards on prisoners, so the guards were already encouraged to behave badly. Actually, most of the bad things that the guards did were conceived by the student who came up with the idea of the experiment. And on top of that, the researcher that conducted the experiment also played in the experiment himself. Which is breaking one of like the most basic rules of research. The conductors of the research should never interfere with the research, let alone participate in it. So this was not a reliable experiment at all. So this is one of those books that's full of so much information, but at the end you walk away from it with a completely new view of the world. And for me, that was the knowledge that everything changes and nothing is set in stone. Through showing the history of humanity from prehistoric times to now, this book shows how societies and norms and practices constantly change. It shows how new most of the things that we currently deem as normal in society are. I think we're all very prone to looking at the world around us and making the argument of that's just how things are, but in reality that's not how things are and they're probably very new and things and systems can always change if we want to. From the sequel to Sapiens what really stuck with me was this thought experiment about humans eating animals and keeping animals for ourselves. It goes like this. So the reason we often give to justify killing and keeping animals for our own is that they are inferior to humans, they are of inferior intelligence and therefore it's okay for us to have power over them. So the question is, if an alien species more intelligent and capable than us humans invades Earth, does that mean that they are just completely justified in enslaving us? Or for example, if we create an artificial intelligence that becomes more intelligent than us, according to that logic, we should just let them use us because we are inferior to them. The one thing that really stuck with me from this book is the idea that mediocrity is the new failure and don't let that get to you. So I always keep thinking about this experiment that was mentioned in this book. It was an experiment where they just gave 3,000 pounds to 13 homeless people and it turns out that no they don't just end up spending it all on drugs. Instead, they got their lives back on track. They took courses, went to rehab, visited family, and after one and a half year, half of them was no longer homeless. And the best thing, in total, this experiment cost less than the usual cost of homelessness help and regulation. So all this money that we spend on homelessness regulation would be way better spent on just homeless people. This is a work of philosophy by Albert Camus. This book taught me to not read philosophy books right before going to bed because you will forget everything. <laughs> it also taught me to make notes on my nonfiction books because I've forgotten everything about this. Except, of course, for the central thesis, which I really appreciate. Maybe life is meaningless, but that's actually a pretty great thing.
Here's a story that the author shared that really stuck with me. So it's the story of a company that hired an important expert in the field. Because they were waiting for a new project he could work on, they created all these other difficult things that he could already work on in the meantime. But instead, the men decided to take the waiting time to repaint the walls in the building. Because sometimes it's better to do something simple and beneath your expert level if it's necessary and actually useful instead of just doing difficult things that don't actually need to be done. So this is kind of a satirical book by Parisians about Parisians that doesn't take itself too seriously, which I like. You think it's not the book that you learn a lot from because it's mostly for fun, but I personally just really appreciate the French fashion philosophy of less is more and just having a few special items that you really covet instead of always wanting the newest, most trendy thing. And lastly, we have a book about climate change. I have two important things that I want to share from this book. The first thing that we need to all be aware of is that it's mostly poor countries that are getting hit and are already being hit by climate change, since these countries lie in hot places or areas of political unrest, and these problems will only be aggravated by climate change. And the second thing is that climate change is making us realize that there is no division between man and nature. However, you can tell that we're really trying hard to not face that reality by the way we talk about the repercussions of climate change. Everywhere you hear about how insects are dying, how the coral reefs are affected, how polar bears are going extinct, but we really shy away from talking about how this is already affecting us and how people are already dying from heat waves, hurricanes and failed harvests through drought. And that was one message from 20 nonfiction books that I've read. Please share in the comments a message that you got from a book you recently read because I'm actually really curious to see what other people get from like the nonfiction books that they read. If you wanna see more bookish videos like this, subscribe to this channel. <laughs> I haven't really been reading a lot of nonfiction lately, but I really like this, making this video really made me realize that I really like nonfiction and I should start picking up some more from my uh, unread books shelf. <laughs> anyway, I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I will see you soon in another one. Goodbye.